Welcome to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. We're broadcasting live on July 11th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. The city of Northport in Sarasota County is considering what kind of development to build on land near a historic archaeological site called Warm Mineral Springs. Later on in the show, we're going to get an update on Warm Mineral Springs. But first, it's still hot out there. Global temperature records were broken again and again last week based on a data set called ERA-5, the seven days from July 3rd through the 9th were the seven hottest days on record globally. That means the first week of July 2023 was the hottest week ever on record. And today we're going to look at record-breaking temperatures, not on land, but in the marine waters off of Florida. And I'd like to hear what you think about it as well. You can email me at dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. Later on, I'll open the phone lines as well if you want to call 813-239-9663. So joining us now to talk about this and uh, talk about the temperatures in, in Florida waters and how hot it is in the Gulf of Mexico, in Florida Bay, and other waters around Florida is coral reef scientist Bill Precht. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Bill. Good morning, Sean. I'm really glad you could join us. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important topic that we're talking about. I, I, I hope that our listeners are uh, not getting fatigued by all this heat talk, but it's it's very important to talk about it. And you and I have spoken before on WMNF about coral diseases in the past. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. But first, let's talk about how the heat wave is affecting all sorts of marine life. Um, let's begin. Just give us an idea of what kind of temperatures do we know uh, is ha are happening in, say, the Florida Keys right now in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, right now, based on satellite sea surface temperature measurements, as well as buoy measured uh, real water temperatures uh, throughout the Florida Keys, right now we're looking at temperatures that are at least five degrees Fahrenheit above where they normally should be this time of year. And in some places, they're, they've been even higher. For instance, there have been a few buoys in the lower Florida Keys off of Key West that are recording temperatures right now in the mid, low to mid 90s. So 92 degrees Fahrenheit, 93 degrees Fahrenheit. These are temperatures that ha have rarely even been reached in Florida ever. And now we're seeing these temperatures hitting these areas in early mid July. And when I say, before, when we've had super warm waters, that usually occurs with the end of the summer after the, the whole heating period has gone. So we're looking at usually late August, early September for the warmest waters to hit. So we're looking at temperatures that are higher than those temperatures now, and we still have two plus months of summer to go. So that's what's really scary in, in this scenario right now. The Washington Post reports what is called downright shocking temperatures in Florida waters, including temperatures, as you said, of 92 to 96 degrees in the Florida Keys. This morning, I was looking at a tweet from the University of Miami's Brian McNoldy. He was tweeting buoy temperature data with 97 degrees at Johnson Key and 95 degrees at Vaca Key. Maybe, uh, you know, these these numbers aren't shocking for air temperatures, perhaps in the summertime in Florida, but how is it, how difficult is it for waters to get this hot? It's very water? difficult. And and it's, it's partly because it's been so hot air temperature wise, but we've also in a lot of places in South Florida so far this year, we haven't had that much cloudy weather and we haven't had very breezy conditions. So the combination of doldrum, low wind conditions, covered with high solar radiation, covered with, uh, included with high air temperatures, is a recipe for just the warming of the, the shallow waters. And Florida Bay and Biscayne Bay, things like that, because they're so shallow, they get heated faster. And then there's exchange between the, the bays and the open ocean, and, and there's mixing, but there's not enough mixing. And you had mentioned some temperatures. I had heard temperatures just this morning also coming out of Everglades National Park where water temperatures were 95 plus degrees. 
And for some reference, Biscayne Bay is near Miami. Florida Bay is that land between the uh, end of the peninsula, the Everglades, and the Florida Keys. And so there's a lot of corals there. And we're, of course, going to talk about corals more later on in the show, at, very soon in the show, in fact, because, you know, that's that's what your specialty is. And that's where a lot of this water temperature uh, damage is going to be manifested. But I do want to remind people that my guest is coral reef scientist Bill Precht. And we're talking about intense marine heat waves around Florida, and we'll be talking about their impact on corals and other marine life. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, and I'd like to hear what your experiences have been as well. You can email dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. So um, we mentioned that the, you mentioned that is that the doldrums, the lack of wind, the lack of maybe some major storms so far have ha have added up to this these high temperatures. Is it possible we might get relief from the Saharan dust storm, dust storm that's coming over? There's, there's a possibility that we may get some relief, but Sahara dust usually manifests itself into dry conditions. And while it may reduce some UV radiation, uh, which would help. I don't think it will be a, a saving grace. I think what we really need to have is a shift in, in the jet stream patterns, which in change will uh, then change the, the pattern of the, of the trade winds. And if we could increase trade winds, get back to some normal conditions where we have, you know, typical Florida wet season conditions with lots of rain in the afternoon, that would that would definitely help, but we're not seeing that right now. And uh, let me read this email that came in from Charles in Tampa. He writes, when experts in the field refer to a normal temperature, he says, I assume that's an average over many years. Does that average include the recent above average temperatures? And he goes on to say, obviously, if so, that would skew the departure from normal downward. On average, the average would be higher. So um, what would you say to Charles in Tampa regarding the our above average temperatures now? Well, we, we have been above average. And in fact, the last 10 years have been the warmest 10 years in history. Uh, the, the data that the uh, NOAA uses is they use an average temperature in the 20th century. So basically, they're looking at a 100-year average temperature, and then they're looking for departures above and below that average. So when we're talking about this, we're not really just looking at the, at the skewness of the last 10 years. We're looking at this 100-year average from last century, and that really helps. Um, there have been some studies done by the United States Geological Survey that were done uh, a few years ago, and what they showed was that, and they were talking about the last 10 years actually, and they were saying that the late summer temperatures of water temperatures warmer than 84 degrees Fahrenheit were warmer than the 100 year average before that. So we're, those were temperatures of 84, 85, 86 degrees. Now we're looking at temperatures that are in the 90s. And we're going into territory that we've never seen in Florida. And the other thing that's a little scary on top of what's going on is it's an El Nino year. And El Nino is just something that's sort of additive to the local conditions. So right now, the local conditions are, are really warm. And El Nino could make that even get warmer. So when we look down the next few months, we could be looking at temperatures that stay in the mid, maybe even upper 90s for weeks or even months at a time. Again, territory that we've never seen. I want to remind people that our guest is coral reef scientist Bill Precht, and we're talking about the intense marine heat wave around Florida and its impact on other marine life. And so let's turn now to that. Um, so these temperatures are hot, maybe hotter than we've ever seen, or at least super early in the season. It's it's very hot. What does that mean for corals? So let's out, let's start out before we maybe get to that question. Just tell our listeners what corals are and and coral reefs are. Corals are animals, and they're similar in many respects to a jellyfish, and but they make a skeleton and they secrete that skeleton out of seawater 
and it's it's limestone, it's calcium carbonate. And when they're growing in the tissues of the coral, they have a symbiotic association uh, with an algae that lives in their tissues. And that algae basically photosynthesizes. And it's the, the organism that makes the coral colored, basically. So it's involved in basically oxygen and CO2 respiration, but that helps the coral basically in its nutrition. It also helps it secrete its calcium carbonate test. So when temperatures in corals get very warm, basically the first thing they wanna do is they go into self-preservation mode and they, they essentially throw up. And what they do is when they throw up, they ex extrude their, these algal symbionts, these, these algal cells that are in their tissue. So when that happens, basically the coral becomes colorless. And that's why we call it coral bleaching because then all we see is the white skeleton. So we see live tissue sitting over white coral skeleton. And when you dive over that or swim over that, you see these white coral colonies and that's known as bleaching. If a coral stays bleached for a long period of time because it's stressed for a long period of time, it can actually die. And this has happened before. And in the Florida Keys, we've seen this periodically. The last time we had major bleaching event in Florida was the summers of 2014 and 2015. Before that, the summer of 2005. Before that, the summer of 1998. And every time we've had those bleaching events, we've had some levels of coral mortality associated with it. And partly the reason why corals bleach again has to do with this stress where corals get stressed. And the longer they're stressed, the, the worse it is. So right now we're looking at temperatures in the 90 degree range, 90 plus degree range. That is very stressful for corals. But if they're only stressed for a week, they can get over it. However, if they're stressed for week after week after week, there's a thing known as degree heating weeks. And these are the amount of days or the amount of weeks where the coral is stressed above its normal conditions. And in those conditions, corals tend to bleach. And if they are stressed for a long period of time, they bleach extensively. And when I say extensively, we're talking about most of the corals out on the reef will actually bleach. And if this occurs for really long periods of time, these corals will actually die. And we've seen examples already this year of corals bleaching in the Florida Keys. What reports have you heard or what have you seen? Well, I've seen photographs just this morning of of uh, fire coral, which is one of the first corals to bleach. It's in very shallow water uh, species called Millipora alsicornis. And it's been, there have been reports of Millipora bleaching throughout the Florida Keys in shallow water for the last two weeks. Uh, a friend of mine who's a professor at a university in Texas was here with a class last week, and she was diving on some reefs in the lower Florida Keys, including Lou Key and in the sanctuary, and she reported that a fair number of corals that she saw were already bleached or starting to pale. So this is, again, we're looking at conditions that usually don't happen until late August, and we're seeing them now in early July. I want to remind people that our guest is coral reef scientist Bill Precht. We're talking about the intense marine heat wave that's happening in Florida waters and its impact on corals and other marine life. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And uh, I was looking at the NOAA Coral Reef Watch outlook of coral bleaching heat stress that was released last week, and it had almost all of the Caribbean falling under what's called a 90% chance of uh, of coral bleaching, where a stress level was predicted by 90% of ensemble members. I think what they mean by that is um, coral species or coral individuals at what they are calling alert level two or alert level one through October. That doesn't sound uh, very promising for something in early to mid July. No, it's not. And uh, alert level two is a prediction basically saying right now, we've already exceeded the bleaching threshold for corals. And if we continue down this path, there's a likelihood that the corals will bleach. And if it continues for a longer period of time, the likelihood gets even worse. So basically what we're looking at now is we've already exceeded our bleaching threshold temperatures 
for many of these corals. And now we're a couple weeks into that exceedance of that value. And for every day that we exceed that value, the corals get more and more stressed. And when they say a level one bleaching by October, that's again, by the end of the summer. So if you look at the cumulative heat stress that will develop all summer, unless we get some major reprieve, we're looking at a level one bleaching threat, which is the likelihood of more than 90% of all the corals bleaching in, in South Florida. My next question has to do, it. it um, this email that came in from a listener leads into my question. So um, Bubba writes, has, he says, thank you for the topic. Has your guest, guest done any work with the Florida Aquarium's coral farming project? And so my next question ha was going to be about uh, this success story that we've seen with corals, which is being able to breed corals in the laboratory and then place them out on the reef to cement them to the reef. And this has been a success story. We've seen where even cases where these new corals that were placed on the reef have, have started to breed, have, have started to spawn. Um, so on top of that, Bubba's question about whether you've done work with a coral farming, what have we seen with these farmed corals? Have they been able to withstand the high temperatures? So that's those are great questions. So the first thing is, I have not personally worked with the people at the Fall Art Aquarium, but I, I do know them personally, and a couple of them are, are friends of mine. Um, specifically, what the Florida Aquarium was involved in, which, which has been a really wonderful it's, it's one of the good news stories that's come out of the last 10 years of coral science in Florida. But uh, last time we spoke, Sean, we were talking about a thing called stony coral tissue loss disease. And there was a movement to basically go out and sample live corals from their natural habitats throughout the Florida reef track and put them in aquariums around the country. And one of the aquariums that were accepting corals from this pool of salvaged corals was the Florida Aquarium. And what they've been able to do is take these samples and grow them in the, in the lab, in the aquariums, and they've been able to break them up and make smaller ones out of the, out of the parent colonies and grow those up. And what they've actually been able to do then, as the uh, listener noted, they've been able to get some of these species to reproduce in the lab. Now we've taken some of those corals and we've outplanted them on the reef. And in some cases, some of those corals have actually spawned on the reef. These are all great stories. Right now, we don't know what the status of those corals will be under these temperature conditions. And one the report that I told you about the professor from Texas who was in Lou Key, she had specifically been going to sites where they had outplanted corals from the previous two summers and the corals that they had outplanted from laboratory work were all bleached. So we don't know really what, what the news is because again, we're heading into territory with temperatures that we've never seen before. Well, let's, you mentioned a moment ago, stony coral tissue loss disease. And it's been going on for several years in Florida. It's really impacted Flor Floridian corals, but also corals around the Caribbean. Uh, what is stony coral tissue loss disease and how has it impacted the coral populations? Stony coral tissue loss disease is a disease that started in South Florida in Miami-Dade County in the late summer, early fall of 2014. And since has spread throughout the Florida reef track all the way up to Martin County, all the way down to the dry tortugas. And it took about five and a half years to basically spread throughout Florida. And now it's been spreading through the Caribbean since about 2018. Uh, and it continues to spread. It's a waterborne pathogen. Uh, most people believe that, that study this, this disease, that it's a, bacter a bacterial origin. So there's some sort of pathogenic bacteria that infects a stressed coral host and then the coral will die. Uh, right now in Florida, we've probably since 2014, 2015, depending upon where you are, we've lost somewhere around 50% of what was there. So if coral cover say was 5% 
10 years ago, eight years ago, now we're looking at coral cover that's half that. And so what we're talking about now is corals that have undergone Caribbean-wide, Florida-wide, this incredible stress event from this disease that killed a lot of corals. We have corals that are remaining. And now that's the corals that are remaining that could get potentially impacted by this bleaching event. That's why this is really so devastating. Our guest is coral reef scientist, Bill Precht. We're talking about the intense marine heat wave that's happening around Florida and its impact on corals and other marine life. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. We only have a few minutes left uh, in, in a, I, I guess maybe I have a couple of questions. Um, a caller is, we don't have time for the phone call, but he was asking if there was any coral bleaching before 1998. And I think what he might be getting at is wondering if if it's really global warming that's causing the, these intense heat um, heat uh, uh, stressors. And if if there was, uh, how, how bad the coral bleaching was before 1998. Okay, so the first known bleaching event in Florida occurred in the summer of 1983. And in the summer of 1983, which was an El Nino year, by the way, was the first mass coral bleaching events known from the Indo-Pacific, especially the Eastern Pacific. And we also saw some coral mortality down in the Caribbean side of Panama in the summer of 1983. Then we saw a mass coral bleaching event in the Caribbean in 1987. And then we saw some bleaching in the Caribbean in 95. And then we had another major El Nino event, catastrophic levels of coral bleaching worldwide, including in Florida in 1998, some more bleaching in 2005, 2014, 15, and now again. So this is something that in terms of reefs in Florida, we've only seen since 1983. So maybe my final question here is what can be done? There's there's intense heat and this, corals are likely to bleach and die this year in Florida. Um, how bad could it get and what can be done? Okay, how bad can it get? If we don't see any reprieve in temperatures, we look at 90 degree temperatures over the span of the next three months, we could see levels of coral mortality from bleaching that we've never seen before. So that means we could lose, potentially lose 90% of what's left. We lose 90% of what's left, that would be absolutely catastrophic. And I don't wanna sound you know, like I'm, I'm you know, chicken little, but this is, this is really scary territory that we're heading towards. What can we do right now today to stop this? Nothing. Can, we can't just go run out and collect corals and put them in, in aquariums right now because it's too late. This is basically a cumulative effect of global warming and global climate change. But what we can do is continue down the path like the Florida Aquarium has been doing and studying these corals, taking them in the lab and then doing genetic research and finding out which genotypes of specific corals may be more heat resistant than others and then use those in the future to restore reefs that have been devastated by natural events. When I say natural events, this is a natural event, but it has been basically the fire has been stoked by the burning of, of fossil fuels. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Bill. Thank you very much, Sean. I really appreciate you coming on. Bill Precht is a coral reef scientist, and we've been talking about how corals and other coral reef organisms are faring in this historic marine heat wave that is scorching Florida waters, leading to early summer coral bleaching. We're going to take a short music break, and then we'll turn to our next topic. We'll get an update on a proposal to develop land near warm mineral springs in the Sarasota County community of Northport. That's coming up in about a minute. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Thank you.
Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. For the rest of today's show, we're going to get an update on Warm Mineral Springs. It's a park in Northport in southern Sarasota County. Back in May, we heard about a public-private partnership that proposed building condos and a resort on land near that archaeologically important site. And yesterday, there was a Northport City Commission workshop on the proposal and on results of a survey of residents. So joining us now is David Iannotti, a resident who has spoken out against intense development at Warm Mineral Springs. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, David. Thank you, Sean. Good morning. Good morning. I'm really glad you can join us. And let's begin by just having you to describe Warm Mineral Springs. If someone has not been there before, how would you describe it? Sure. So Warm Mineral Springs is is unique in Florida. It is the only warm spring. Uh, the temperature, I believe, is somewhere around 85 degrees consistently. Uh, the reason for that is a hot vent, I believe about 240 feet deep down. Uh, there are also some what we'd call a cold vent in Florida, which is 72 degrees. So it mixes and when it gets to the top, we have that roughly 85 degree temperature. It is the only uh, spring of that nature in the state. And as a result, it is also the uh, source of a critical uh, manatee habitat. Uh, FWC actually calls it the most important natural warm water refuge for manatees in Southwest Florida. In fact, it's the only natural warm water refugee, uh, refuge for uh, manatees. Uh, over 100 manatees have actually been uh, documented using the uh, creek that emanates from the spring. The spring itself is, is used commercially for bathing. Um, many of the people who use the springs uh, swear by its healing powers. It's, it does have a very high mineral content. And uh, there are many people who believe in uh, bathing in mineral waters for uh, medicinal purposes. Uh, so the day-to-day uh, -day activities at the Springs um, is generally a, a very loyal following of people who are there to bathe. Um, the Springs originally started as that type of uh, destination in, in the 1940s. That's when it would have been originally um, used for that purpose. Um, since then, it's pretty much been in private hands till about I want to say about 2000 and I think it was about 2010 and uh, the private owner uh, went into bankruptcy and at that time Sarasota County jointly purchased the springs with the city of Northport shortly thereafter uh, due to disagreements of what should be done at the springs uh, mainly the, the county wanted to develop it with a hotel the city did not uh, city residents at the time were against that as well so the city of Northport actually sold its share of uh, Warm Mineral Springs to, uh, or I should say, Sarasota County sold their share and the city of Northport in 2014 became the sole owner of the Warm Mineral Springs property, which is an 82 acre parcel. And uh, it, it has had some disturbances, but it does also still have intact uh, native canopy. Um, a recent environmental survey conducted by the city of Northport um, actually found two rare or threatened plant species, uh, a, a giant air plant, a Talantia species, as well as a um, orchid uh, species, um, which is, I believe, the beaked ladies' tresses. Um, those are rare uh, and threatened plants that are on the property currently. That same survey found over 100 gopher tortoise burrows. And it also found a, a gopher tortoise itself, a, a live tortoise, and a, a threatened wood stork, if I'm reading from the Threatened Endangered Species Survey that was conducted for that area. I want to remind people that our guest is David Iannotti, a resident who has spoken out against intense development in warm mineral springs. And they um, there's also an archaeological history here Ten, uh, maybe uh, nine to 12,000 years ago, I forget the exact date, but uh, there was a, um, a Native American uh, residence there, uh, habitat there, and it's believed that it's possible that the sinkhole was used as a burial site, and so some, some bones have been discovered there. Do you have anything to add about the historic or archaeological significance of the site? 
Yeah, I mean, historically, it's fascinating. It, it is a it has a rich archaeological history there. Uh, about twelve thousand years ago, remains were dated to that roughly that time uh, frame that were removed from the springs in the nineteen fifties. Um, that time frame, the coast of Florida, the Gulf Coast, or the, the above water portion of Florida, would have been significantly further out into the Gulf. So, Warm Mineral Springs at the time would have been a very rare freshwater inland habitat or inland uh, water resource. The water table also would have been much lower at the time. So the water would have been about, I believe, 50 to 90 feet below the current level. So uh, Native Americans um, from, from everything that's been uh, found in the springs, uh, which would basically be uh, indicate that it was used in a fashion where uh, it was actually a uh, trap uh, for them to um, hunt. Uh, so they would trap animals uh, using the spring and they would lower themselves down into the spring to access the water. This was originally discovered in the 1950s uh, by William Royal, who uh, dove in the springs and saw that there were stalactites, which basically indicated that what he was seeing in the spring would have been, uh, you know, above water at one point because stalactites don't form um, if, if they're underwater. So uh, that was initially something that in the scientific community wasn't given a lot of merit. Um, however, uh, state archaeologists over the next 20 years, particularly in the 1970s, uh, basically validated all of the work he had done. And um, the remains that he uh, had removed from the springs were carbon dated to, I believe, roughly 10,000 years uh, old, which at the time uh, was really the oldest uh, evidence of uh, inhabitants in, in Eastern North America that had that ever been found. In fact, it wasn't believed that people were in the area at that time. So it was really a, a significant discovery that happened there. And the Springs has also yielded other uh, artifacts um, uh, as well as evidence of saber-toothed cat and, and other animals that are uh, since uh, long extinct. We're talking about Warm Mineral Springs, and the reason we're talking about it is because it's owned by the city of Northport, as you mentioned, which is in South, some South Sarasota County. And there's there are three historic buildings on the site from the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, and they're in disrepair. And so the city has, a, a I guess, a motivation to be able to restore those buildings or or make sure they they're kept up and they thought that maybe a private public private partnership which you'll uh, will are is also called a p3 um would help that but when the went out for a, a developer to give them a, a partner it came back with this development plan that included condos and included um a, a spa what did it look like when, what would Warm Springs, Warm Mineral Springs look like if this plan does go through? Yeah, so just a, a little a brief background before that. When the city acquired the property in 2014, the city did undertake a study uh, to actually uh, find out what the residents wanted to see there. That eventually resulted in something called a 2019 master plan. And that master plan uh, had multiple, I believe, six public meetings. It had multiple surveys and it was put together with community and uh, city staff uh, input. That led to the 2019 master plan uh, that most people in the community uh, basically thought was going to be the future for Warm Mineral Springs. It was low intensity development. It was a uh, outdoor event space, uh, possibly for things like um, small concerts or weddings. And other than that, it was the existing buildings uh, rehabilitated, uh, the restaurant that was already there. Um, and trails and in the future a connection to the legacy trail which is a bicycle and pedestrian trail that runs through all of sarasota county and is actually part of a, a much larger uh florida-wide uh trail system and, and trail initiative uh that was pretty abruptly uh discarded when the p3 came about last year uh the p3 that uh was proposed by a, a private developer had, um, I believe, a 
250 room hotel was the number, a multi-story and about 350 timeshare condos, um, as well as a large event center. Um, that was the initial proposal. And um, there was a lot of community uh, pushback on that at the city commission meetings. The city uh, of Northport decided that they would uh, have their own survey, uh, a new survey put out that would get randomly uh, sent to city residents so that they could have a statistically valid uh, result of what people wanted to see at Warren Mineral Springs. Those survey results came back about a month ago and they almost exactly mirror the 2019 master plan. Uh, about 88% of all people given all options, want to see low intensity. Um, very, very few people, I think it was less than 5%, wanted anything high intensity. So the 2019 master plan was cor corroborated by this recent survey. Our guest is David Iannotti, a Northport resident who's spoken out against intense development at Warm Mineral Springs. He was just telling you about the survey that was discussed yesterday at a city commission meeting. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. So at yesterday's meeting, I, I got the impression from what I read in the Sarasota Herald Tribune that you spoke out against the, the um, development plan at, the, at yesterday's meeting. What was the mood like from people who were, who like you, were members of the public who spoke at that meeting? Well, yeah, I, you know, honestly, it was very frustrating. Um, I don't know how anyone could objectively look at these survey results, and they are on the city's website. If you search City of Northport, um, Warm Mineral Springs, there is a page just for Warm Mineral Springs. It actually has all of the pertinent documents. I give the city a lot of credit for having all that information there. The 2019 master plan is there. The recent survey they did, the recent environmental survey of the property they did, it's all there. Anybody who was in attendance that had looked at those survey results, um, there was a lot of frustration in the uh, audience over the commission uh, discussion of those results, because essentially the commission was, commissioners, uh, most of them were essentially discrediting the, the survey that they had commissioned. So it really starts to look like, well, we didn't get the results we wanted, so there's something wrong with the survey. Um, you know, the the results that were included uh, for discussion were only the ones that were randomly selected. Uh, they were mailed out to 2,500 homes. They got a 40% uh, response rate um, in, in terms of people who filled it out and returned it. That's actually far above what they would normally get for a return. Uh, and this company uh, that uh, held the survey is a national company uh, that works all over the, the the nation and they do everything from government polling to political polling and the uh, the, the methodology is sound and their uh, margin of error is three percent with 95 percent certainty uh, so to hear the commissioners try and poke holes in it it was frustrating for people who have said now for years and years what they want to see at Warm Mineral Springs. So this goes back, you know, all the way to 2014 that these buildings, the city has done nothing with, and they've just gone into disrepair. And every time they have a meeting or decide they want to have another survey, that just remains that way. It's almost as if the worst shape it's in, the more we can, um, try and find some way to develop this property that's not a reflection of what the community has voiced. And despite what the results of the survey were, which I'm going to um, mention what I, I'll read in this read from the Sarasota Herald Tribune, the online serve part of the survey, more than 92% of the 666 people who responded to the online favored low intensity development at Warm Mineral Springs, and that the overwhelming majority of all, all of them, including the ones that were mailed out, favored low intensity development that did not include a hotel or condominium. So maybe now is a time to say um, what and the the commissioners seem to be moving ahead. There's going to be more hearings or more kind of bent on having this 19, is it $19 million um, 
uh, public-private partnership development there that would include pretty high intensity development on Warm Mineral Springs. Yeah, so if they were to move forward with this, which they do seem to intend to want to keep pursuing this path, uh, it basically entails the city giving $9.4 million that was already in place in a fund for the work at Warm Mineral Springs, which was always supposed to be phased restoration going back to the 2019 plan. So that's what people have always wanted. This recent survey also uh, indicated that because there was a question specifically asking phased improvements, and that was the overwhelming majority again. So if it was to go forward, the de private developer gets $9.3 million, basically the, the public money that was in a fund to, to do the restoration there. And they would also have the property, the 60 acres of the 82 acres, deeded over to them in a 99-year lease. That was the, the last details that were provided that I am aware of. Uh, the proposal yesterday, the developer uh, PDF, uh, which should have more details, is not available as of this morning yet. It should be available today for the public. Uh, but when they presented yesterday, it was not part of the attached backup material on the agenda. Um, there's details that really need to be looked at. Now, yesterday's presentation by the developer, they, they put it forward as being a scaled back version of their original proposal. However, it's actually, from what I see, more intensive, makes uh, more use of the property. Uh, they, in their new proposal, they have reduced the number of hotel rooms by 100, but they add 50, quote unquote, eco cabins, 50 additional buildings. They add an amphitheater, which wasn't originally there. And they add a 36 hole putt putt golf, mini golf course. Um, none of those um, were in the initial plan. So where they scaled back some units on the hotel, they added a lot more in other buildings. Um, there was also a slight reduction uh, I believe from about 320 to 277 in the timeshare condos. Uh, overall, if you look at the proposal map uh, and contrast it with the 2019 master plan, uh, it is nothing like the people have indicated they want multiple times in the city. Uh, so uh, really there's, there's a disconnect there. And I really hope our commission, um, you know, thinks long and hard about that and figures out a way to, to strike an actual uh, balance and representation of what people want with this truly unique uh, resource. Our guest is Northport resident David Iannotti, and we're talking about proposed development around Warm Mineral Springs in South Sarasota County. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're coming to you from the students of WMNF in Tampa. I'd like to hear your thoughts about Warm Mineral Springs and potential development there. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885, or you can call 813-239-9663. Bubba writes in, he says, why not make it a state park? Would your guests support that idea? So, David, would would uh, having it be a state park, would that be would like? And maybe do you know anything about the state's appetite for making it a state park? Right. Yeah, I think so. I think that is in, in no small part. The state needs to be involved. I know that that has been discussed in the past. Uh, I don't know that there was the interest, at least previously. Um, one thing we should mention in this discussion is up until about a month ago, the uh, city of Northport, um, by unanimous decision, the commission had sent to the state legislature for Warm Mineral Springs to be considered as an outstanding Florida spring. An outstanding Florida spring is a designation that brings uh, additional protection to the spring. And it does also uh, require um, some of the area to um, monies for uh, switching to sewer, which is a, a serious problem in the area surrounding that spring. Um, there are many septic tanks and the flow of that spring is degrading over time. Um, that designation or that application for designation was actually pulled by the city manager uh, kind of last minute in the last legislative session. And it was done without the commission themselves actually having discussion over it. So there's actually been a lot of um, talk about that 
action by the city manager uh, in the city of Northport. In fact, one of the commissioners actually um, asked the other commissioners to investigate his actions and the other commissioners uh, voted against her. Um, this would be Commissioner McDowell uh, asked that there be an investigation into the city manager, Jerome Fletcher's actions. And uh, she was uh, pretty summarily voted down four to one by the commission that uh, in their opinion, there was, there was nothing to investigate. Uh, so that's a, a little background in terms of possible state involvement in, in this property at least as designating as an outstanding springs. And most of the people that care about warm mineral springs um, and its uh, you know, uh, ecological value, its, its habitat value, its archeological value and its uh, cultural value would like to see that outstanding springs designation to not only protect it, but also provide money to the city to uh, properly uh, have, have sewer around the area. And you mentioned Commissioner De Debbie McDowell from North, the city of Northport. We had her on the show about two months ago, and this was about the time when she was investigating or hoping that the city commissioners, uh, sorry, the, the managers um, would be inv investigated. And she was talking on this show about how important it was to have low intensity development on uh, at warm mineral springs, as opposed to this plan for the development of um, condos. And, and now we're hearing about putt-putt golf. So let's just hear a couple of minutes. This is, uh, this is what Debbie McDowell was saying in uh, back in May about warm mineral springs. You're listening to WMNF. Well, the concept plan is that they will fix the buildings, they'll do the parking lot, they'll do everything we wanted to do in phase one, and they want to get some return on that investment by developing phase two, which is that 60 acres of parkland. So back to your question is the different options. So option one was not intensive. Um, option two was very minimally intensive. Option three was kind of an in-between, and option four was highly intensive. Um, I leaned towards the least intensive possible, which very much mirrored what our um, master plan that we approved back in 2019 to keep it parkland. Yes, we are going to have to build some things on it, you know, nature trails. We had um, a museum planned, an amphitheater of sorts planned. We had some um, high above the trees um, scaping so that you could climb up and see the vastness because it's very close to Deer Prairie Creek and Shoei Ranch. So you could see this natural beauty that you can see from the air. Um, and that's where I was leaning. My colleagues was leaning towards more intensive and, and development of a resort and some residential components to it. Okay, we'll put in a, a museum and the developer would, would have like hiking trails and zip lining and stuff in the center to have it accessible that area to the general public. To me, when the city purchased it, they purchased it to have it all available to the public, um, that 60 acres. The, the 20 acres is available to the public, but it has an admission fee attached to it. So there's a, a difference of opinions up on the dais. Um, I firmly believe there are two ways you can approach economic development. You can pave over every square inch and have a few little hiking trails, or you can do what we what we have seen done here in the county, Sarasota County, with uh, the Mayaka, Hatch, Mayaka State Park and Oscar Shearer State Park, where it is an economic driver. Well, that was City Commissioner of Northport, Debbie McDowell, speaking to Tuesday Cafe back in May. And our guest is David Iannotti, a resident who has spoken out against intense development at Warm Mineral Springs. So this was the, that one single commissioner there that's talking about the less intense development, uh, kind of along the same lines of, as what you were saying earlier, David. Yeah. Commissioner McDowell has really been the sole voice on the commission that has um sought the low intensity development um, with some amenities added. Um, you know, part of this discussion has really been the city wants to frame it as um, the springs is a liability. 
However, the Springs is the only thing that the city of Northport owns that actually turns a profit. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, fuzzy math presented on the dais as well. Um, the numbers are there, however, and in last last year, even in the the state of disrepair it's been allowed to slip into, the Springs had a net profit of a million dollars. So they really need to be careful if they want to, you know, honestly portray the situation. The, the Springs is, is not a drag on the economy in any way. Now, having said that, money does need to be invested in it to make it um, what it really should be. Uh, the buildings, you know, have just been allowed to really become really derelict at this point. And that's years and years of inaction, even though the city has been through their own uh, studies, uh, been told, so to speak, what, what the residents want there. Uh, nothing is, has happened. Uh, and it's just this perpetual football that seems to get kicked down the road where they, they bring it up. They talk about how terrible it's in disrepair and now, as of late, like this is the only solution. We have to uh, have a P3, which I would like to add. Um, a P3 is something that in the state of Florida was instituted for large infrastructure projects. In fact, it came out of the, the DOT. Uh, I-595, I believe, was a P3 project. These are huge projects that require immense sums of money that local governments may not have. So they partner with a, a private developer to accomplish uh, this project. Th these are projects that were legally required to have clear public use and benefit. So these could be schools, these could be highways. Um, these are the types of things that a P3 really was uh, designed for, uh, implemented for. However, you're starting to see, and not just here in Northport, um, you know, kind of a in my opinion, a misuse of a P3. I don't, I don't see how you can justify uh, what we're talking about at Warm Mineral Springs benefiting the public. In fact, it would vastly reduce uh, public access to the park. It would uh, vastly uh, benefit a developer uh, disproportionately to the public. Uh, I don't know how condominiums, timeshare condominiums could possibly be viewed as something that benefits the public. Uh, so this is really uh, something that I think statewide people should be aware of. Um, there are other examples of governments using P3s for, for projects that, uh, in my opinion, are, are not uh, do not meet the legal requirements for uh, a P3. Jackie and Clearwater writes, thank you for the show and thank you to the people who have spoken out, including today's guest. These are essential topics for the health of our planet. She says that nature must win or we'll all lose. So thank you to Jackie and Clearwater. And David, we have maybe about uh, 30 seconds left. Is there anything else that you would suggest if people want to follow this topic or if they, if they want to uh, comment on it, what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I'd really encourage everybody to get involved. Anybody who cares about whether locally or, or statewide to write to our commissioners in the city of Northport um, or attend our commission meetings and, and speak for the Springs. Um, this is a truly unique uh, historical archaeological resource. It's been there for tens of thousands of years. And, um, you know, I, I believe there is a duty for us to be stewards to pass on to posterity something that protects and honors that site, not exploits it. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe, David. Thank you. David Iannotti is a resident of Sarasota County in the community of Northport. He's concerned about proposed development at Warm Mineral Springs. I want to thank also my earlier guest, coral reef scientist Bill Precht. If you missed either of these interviews, you can watch them beginning this afternoon on our website, WMNF.org. Tuesday Cafe also airs on the television station TBAE on Tuesdays at 8 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. Coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. They'll continue the conversation about climate climate inaction with climate action that is with Tampa's first sustainable re sustainability and resilience officer Walt Reamer. This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on July 11th, 2023 from the studios of WMNF Tampa. 
We also broadcast to St. Pete, Sarasota, Lakeland, and beyond on WMNF.org and on the WMNF app. You can support programming like this by making a contribution at WMNF.org. Thank you.